Hey, hey guys, I've got the lights set up. Hopefully we're gonna have a good stream because we're gonna talk about setting up uh, the, the fourth axis here on, uh, on this X7. See a few of you guys are on here. I talked about doing this video uh, a couple of weeks ago, and the challenge is that I really wasn't sure what the right way to communicate this was. All right, I'm gonna dump my earbud because I've got my phone here. I wanted to listen to the stream to make sure that the audio was good because I'm using a shotgun mic. I don't normally use a shotgun mic. I try to use a lapel mic. And in the past when I've used my earbuds, it just didn't work. So here we've got a fourth axis set up in the X7. Now this video is gonna be good for anybody with a fourth axis. It doesn't matter if you've got a Haas, a Tormach, whatever. The fundamentals that I cover here today uh, should work in any CNC machining center. And I would encourage you guys to ask questions. And I'm just gonna share with you some of the things that I've done uh, to get a good result. And this can be a little tricky, okay? So the first thing I wanna do is I'm actually gonna take the camera over to my workbench because I wanna show you guys the setup. Uh, the, keep in mind, this is quick and dirty. This is just conceptual. I know that you guys are incredibly talented. So many of you have reached out and shared setups and parts and fixturing. And I know that by and large, the community that watches me here on Nerdly, you guys are incredibly talented and capable and smart people, right? So I don't think I need to hold your hand and take you through each step. And you don't need to watch me do it. You just need the fundamentals, the kind of the, the, the broad overview that'll take you to where you need to go. So uh, before we head over to CAD, let me pull the camera over here and show you guys what's going on. So this is the fourth axis that came with the X7. And, and you can see that it sticks off pretty close. It's, it's, it's about a finger's, finger's width here. And it clears, clears the door at maximum wide travel. And on this particular setup, will this let me zoom? I think it will. Oh, it will, that is awesome. Okay, so on this particular setup, what you'll see is that we have the fourth axis that came from the boys at Sile. We have the master faceplate, and if anybody's wondering, I made these T-nuts myself. And if you guys need some, I can make a bunch more. These are just steel T-nuts that I made real quickly. I just machined them and then I rigid tapped them here on the X7. So we've got some hardware that's M8. I made this adapter plate, this faceplate, so that we could bolt the fifth axis. This is a V. 75100X vise onto here. And I actually have a really nice M-lock vise that I'd like to get on here at some point in the, in the future, but it's a little bit larger. But there are a few, let me just cover the basics for installing this. The first thing, when you get your fourth axis on the table, you wanna make sure that there's no yaw in it, no twist in it. And so you'll take an indicator and you'll run across your uh, attachment plate, the mounting face of the rotary. This makes sure that you're in line with the y-axis. Then you're going to indicate it up and down with the z-axis on the face to make sure that there's no tilt in the setup. So first you've got no, you got no twist, then you don't want to have any tilt. If you do end up in a position where you have tilt, Okay, if you end up in a position where you guys have tilt, this isn't ideal, and more often than not, that's something going on with the rotary. Maybe there's a chip under there, so make sure that you've stoned the table and it's nice and clean. But you can go buy something like this. This is an inexpensive set of, uh, I, I see that this is backwards now, there's nothing I can do on this live stream. 
This is Precision Brand Steel Shim Flat Sheets. And it comes in all kinds of thicknesses, okay? It comes all the way down to a, a thousandth or so, uh, up to, you know, 10, 15 thousandths. You can trim a piece out and you can shim the rotary accurately. Obviously, nobody wants to do this, but I've met guys that have very expensive machines from other brands that have had to shim the rotary so that it's so that it, that it trams in and it, it squares up to the Y and the Z axis, okay? Now, there are really two ways of programming a part just like this right here, okay? I would say the easiest way, far and away, is to program from the center line. That just means that you're gonna have to find the center line. And generally what I do, I'm gonna zoom you guys out just a smidge here. Generally what I do is I use my Heimer, I come over here and I touch off here, I touch off here at the same Z depth. That's very important, at the same Z depth. You know what, let me back up a little bit. This plate right here, what I'll do is I will put an indicator on this plate and then I'll come over and I'll rotate it to make sure that there's very little run out in the setup. And once you have very little run out in the setup, you know that you're safe to begin measuring. I'll take a micrometer and I'll measure the width of this plate. So let's just call it four inches. Now what I'll do is I'll take my, we've, we've, we've installed the rotary, it's parallel to the Y axis, it's parallel to the Z axis. We've now put our attachment plate on We've tapped it around so that there's absolutely zero run out. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my Heimer, I'm gonna come over here, and I'm gonna go down about an inch and a half or so, whatever I can reach with my Heimer, and I'm gonna set it. I'm gonna check it here, I'm gonna check it here, and now I have a very rough Y-axis center line, okay? After I get my rough Y-axis center line, then what I do whoop, is I'll take the Heimer and I'll touch off right here on the y-axis center line I'll, I'll zero out the machine and then I'll subtract the radius of my adapter plate now I know that I'm close I'm really close for my y-axis and my z-axis center line right off the rip there are other ways of doing this I've actually used a small chuck a lathe chuck with a gauge pin that has been reduced to zero run out and I've used that as a method there are other machines that can use probing for, for this method, but this is the, in my opinion, one of the best ways to get a rough Y-axis center line, a Y-axis, Z-axis center line right off the rip, and it's really, really fast. And so here's what I want to show you guys. I am going to, I'm going to move this up a little bit. And I'm gonna set this back to G54, G00, X0, Y0. So in case you guys are unfamiliar with the control over here, what I would do is I would just type in, hit MDI. I'd come up to the monitor screen, hit MDI input. And even though you guys can't see what's above here, let's see if this helps a little bit. And we'll just leave it down here. That way you guys can see the machine move. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hit clear, I'm going to hit G54, G00, X0, Y0, A0, decimal, I'm going to hit OK. And now, when we go back, it's going to rotate everything right into position. In fact, I might have to move this over a little bit so you guys can see. Okay? And so... Now this is really the tricky part, okay? Let me grab a paper towel. Once you've put your vise on, you gotta make a decision. What are you gonna use as a datum from the vise? Are you gonna clamp? A lot of guys will take like a vise jaw, they'll clamp it into, into their vise, and they'll sweep along across that, and once they get you know, zero travel, they'll then go into their offset page 
their work offsets and they'll set their G54A0 right here. Now I'll be honest with you, normally I use the vice body, which is not really a datum, but on my first operation, I really don't care. I just wanna make sure that I'm holding onto the material good. I have a repeatable way to, to measure it to make sure it's roughly close. Uh, there, there are pros and cons to doing it a variety of different ways, but I want to, what I wanna show you guys is that there's, uh, there's different ways to accomplish this. And so, just to give you an idea, if you go and you do a 2D contour and you're off center line by let's just say 10 thousandths, well when you roll around, that whole contour is gonna be shifted forward. And so what you can do is you can cut a 2D contour a little bit better than halfway down right here, rotate it 180 degrees, and then do another one and then whatever the step is right here is the difference. It's the, the deviation from what the actual y-axis center line is compared to what your, uh, what your you know, theory is. So I'll show you guys real quick. I just cut this part. And we'll see if this zooms in for you guys. If not, I'll bring the camera in a little bit closer. So this is a tenths indicator, and by the way, I'm going to have a bunch of cosine air on here, better back this up. Sorry, I know this isn't super loud, I'm using my, bike, my mic the best I can. So we're going to go right here. This indicator's only got like 8,000 to travel in it. So back this up, creep up on it. Now we're going to go down in Z. And you can see this, if you guys can't see, there's a different line right here. I'll try to zoom this in for you guys. I don't know how good this camera's gonna do this. Okay. Yeah, bear with me. Okay, so you can see that we're, we're absolutely on the indicator. Okay. Now we're gonna go up and down. And you can see that literally only a couple of ten thousandths difference between those two blended surfaces. That tells me that we are absolutely as accurate as we're gonna get on our y-axis. Now to check to see if we're right on our z-axis, what we would need to know, since, we, since our center line was the z-axis, what we would need to know is how thick is our part compared to what we have commanded. If you're programming from the z-axis from the center line and you command a facing cut, let's just say it's 0.5 inches. Well then you'd have 0.5 above center line here and then when you roll it over you'd have 0.5 above it again. So you should have exactly one inch. If the part is too big, let's just say it's one inch and ten thousandths then all you need to do is lower your z-axis work coordinate by half, by five thousandths, five thousandths if you guys can see, and then take that cut again. And so it's, it literally takes 10 minutes or less to set this up. You install the, you install the fourth axis, you tram it in the y, you make sure that it's square or parallel to the z-axis, if it's not, you can shim it. Most of the time, you're not gonna have to worry about it. And just so you guys know, I would say about a thousandth of an inch or less is what I'm hunting for, for, for precision. If I can get it down to a couple of tenths, even better. We then measure our either, either this part right here, either the actual face of the rotary or our adapter plate. We then use our Heimer to pick up the y-axis center line. Once we have the y-axis center line, we touch off from the middle uh, of the plate using, you know, command the machine right to that location, set the Z, subtract the radius, and you've got a really, really close center line programming, okay? One other option, if you don't want to do all that, if you're not going to program from center line, which is fine, you can just go ahead and put your part right in the vise like this. You could set G54 here or here or anywhere else take your first set of cuts then what you could do is you could after you've finished operation one you could roll this part over 
set a new work offset on your freshly machined features, and you could call that G55, and then boom, you're good to go. You just keep making your parts. A lot of this depends on user preference. A lot of it depends on how accurate you need to be. If you need to make parts that are absolutely lethally accurate, sometimes I find that running two separate work coordinates allows me to ever so slightly adjust work coordinate two, three, and four based on machine growth, uh, uh, temperature uh, swings, temperature variations in your shop, and, uh, and that's that. There's a whole world of possibility when you get into multi-axis machining. In fact, there's a couple companies out there called the Moreside. There's a guy out there that makes a fixture called the Moreside fixture. And what the Moreside fixture actually does is it takes your fourth axis, which obviously you see right now, the fourth axis just rotates about the A axis. But what, what the Moreside fixture does is it actually takes your fourth axis and then it puts another C axis that's manual. A manual, so you basically have manual three plus two or manual five axis machining, not simultaneous, but it allows you to hit basically five sides of a part incredibly inexpensively. And by the way, you guys could easily build your own more side fixture if you're just patient. If you've got a boring head at home and you're willing to be patient and measure some things with a surface plate, some gauge blocks and a couple of indicators, you could very easily make a setup just like that so that you're capable of doing some pretty sophisticated stuff with minimal technology. So I hope this made sense to you guys. If you guys have questions or comments, please tell me. I will do my best right now. I'm gonna grab my phone and I'm gonna try and look in here and see if there's any questions you guys would like uh, me to ask, answer. And uh, if not, then I'll cut you guys loose, let you guys go enjoy your, uh, your weekday. Let's see what we got here. It was totally understandable high from Germany. I built my own more side for fourth. Joe, man, let's show show the world. Let's see what you got, Joe. I'm pumped. I always I love nothing makes me happier than seeing you guys come up with just ingenious inventions, cool products, and uh, a lot of people I think invest in CNC machines like like the X7, and they feel like like that's kind of all encompassing. What I have found in inventing, tinkering, manufacturing, uh, and bringing products to market is that it's very common for a machine like the X7 to kind of be the core or the workhorse that kind of does the most important work, but it also allows you to integrate 3D printers, 3D scanners, lasers, all kinds of other tools in a multi-step process to bring a sophisticated or unique product to market. So, let's see what we got here. Okay, guys, I guess uh, it looks like there's not too many uh, questions or comments. If you guys enjoyed this video, do me a huge favor. I, think, I see six of you have already given it a thumbs up. If this helps you out, you'd be, it shows me that you guys enjoy the content, which is, I do it for you. I want you guys to enjoy this. I want you guys to benefit. I love hearing stories of guys going out there, starting a business in their garage, and then it explodes or it grows up, or seeing guys that just invent things. And this gives you the ability to not have to spend huge amounts of money or waste a bunch of time waiting for somebody else to come through for you guys. So let me see if there's any quick comments here. And if not, then we'll, we'll cut you loose. Let's see here, talk chat, let's see here. Someone said, okay, let's see here. There's a few in here. I built my own more side, which I'm super awesome. Is an old foot, uh, it's an old foot all machine with a fourth axis. Um, what compound raw speed tire works on the fourth axis? Well, no, no compound of raw speed tire works on the fourth axis. But uh, just so you know, we have used this machine to make some of the stuff that you guys are out there enjoying. I can promise you that. So it's one of my, I love the Akuma because it's so big and it's so bad. And it's 18,000 pounds and it's a monster. But a lot of times when I want to do something quick and easy, the X7 is just the easy, it's just the easy way to do it. Specifically because you guys don't know this, but I'm only about 5'8", and I don't, it's not difficult to reach into and out of a little machine like this. So I'm a fan of these uh, smaller machines. Oh, let's see what we got here. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much for coming to hang out real quick. I have, uh, I have some more, uh, I have some more, like 
properly edited content on this topic coming. But I know that there's been a lot of guys, when I first mentioned that we were gonna do this, I had quite a few people reach out. My post processor, uh, for whatever reason, isn't working as good as I thought it would. And so for this particular part, what I actually had to do is I actually had to set the part in four different orientations, top and bottom, and then side, top, side, bottom. Your top and bottom, and then front side, back side. And I just set it all up as G54, G55, G56, G57, and then I just ran those tool paths on this. As soon as I get my post processor sorted out, I'll be sure to share it with any, anybody that has a Syntec control, I will do my, I'll, I'm happy to share it with you, but I do need to get that sorted out because I would like to also cover some of the fourth axis simultaneous machining, which is, comes in incredibly useful for engraving and, uh, and, and industries that go pew pew. So, all right guys, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Keep in touch and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.